right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So um, my name is James Moran. I'm an archetypal astrologer. And I'm here today to talk with you about um, the, the next decade. We've entered into a psychedelic renaissance. So this topic is actually looking at the unfolding of this renaissance that we're already in through the next decade. So where does it go? Because we're already in the renaissance. We, there was the initial kind of encounter of the Western culture with psychedelic healing in the 1950s into the 60s, 70s. And there was a kind of, there was of course a, a, a backlash and a kind of a suppression of that, almost as if somebody entered into a psychedelic experience and was being, and was administered Thorazine or something that would actually suppress the experience. Um, and we, the many people made very productive use of the time in the interim in the 1980s, 1990s, particularly in terms of taking it back to basics and really just going back to square one. There was not much legal support at all for any type of research, financial support either, but people like Johns Hopkins, MAPS and others kind of just stayed the course and kind of stayed, persevered on the path and built in a very uh, Saturnian way, which you'll be hearing about a lot about Saturn in a very Saturnian way, kind of slowly maturely built the foundation that allowed for uh, flowering the psychedelic renaissance. So like, for instance, you make a nice bed in a garden and you really make sure that you take the time to, to that the kind of composition of the soil is just right. Then when the time comes for the plants to take hold, they take hold and everything flowers. And so we're in a psychedelic renaissance and we're looking into the future of what what next? What next in the sense of, you know, it's a very exciting time because we, the world culture has, psychedelics have been integrated in human culture before, most likely for thousands of years in different cultures at various places in the, on earth. But the human culture has taken, has kind of taken a course that's, that is uh, kind of separating the human, kind of drawing the human experience out of and and a, a kind of a couched experience in a world of divinity, almost like the way that we would read the Iliad or the Odyssey or something, where like the, there's there's this world that is very much imbued with divine forces and a lot of meaning. It's imbued with meaning. The world. Um, and there's kind of a conversation between the mortals and the immortals, the humans and the gods. And the world culture and the Western culture just went in a different direction, went in a direction of kind of separating the human experience away from the world and objectifying the world so that the world could be studied in a scientific way, the develop of the scientific method and science and a way of of basically seeing the world as something to be studied apart from the studier. And that led us on a course in which we developed instruments to really look at nature, look at nature through the microscope, look at nature through the telescope and see what, what is this universe? What, what is this universe? What is it really? You know, it's, and then we get, and we understand physics, quantum mechanics, and we can understand that, Oh, that's this, this, you know, we're, we're on a planet in a solar system in a galaxy in a universe that's run by physical laws. <clears throat> and what happened there is that the meaning, the mechanistic nature, the mechanistic appearance of nature and the universe uh, seemed to be devoid of meaning in and of itself. So the meaning looked like it was projected from the human, from the human onto the outer world, like, like an artist would paint on a canvas and that meaning is just something that's just limited to the human psychology, which is to say the human mind, which is to say inside our skull and inside our body. That's, that's you know, the meaning is kind of the chemistry inside ourselves. Again, mechanistic chemistry inside ourselves just kind of comes up with that meaning, projects it outward, and there's a sense of a mechanical universe. And that has brought us to a place where we have now come back and encountered psychedelic healing again 
and it's almost as if we um you know like evolution or something fish sprouted legs and got out of the water onto land and look back at the water that they were before immersed in and now they are are immersing themselves back into it so now we are again immersing ourselves back into a different experience of reality an experience of reality which takes into account the subject takes into account our experience our quality of experience it's not as objective subjective and so it's it's a it's an interesting time it's almost you know some people would say that if we need to actually have a separation um from the divine in order to get, have a stance with which back to engage with the divine. And so here we are, we're actually, you know, we've developed science, we've developed a seemingly mastery over our surroundings, but what's the meaning there? What's the purpose behind it all? And now we have psychedelics. Now we're encountering a journey inward again to find out like, well, what, what's, what's the meaning? It's not just a cold, dry examination of reality. What's really the meaning here? And and, and here we are, here we are, we're on the cusp, we're in a new decade, very dramatically opened with 2020 global pandemic. And now psychedelics are being integrated into the systems of laws in the United States and other countries. And so what, what is there moving forward? So I'm gonna just give you a couple of little captions here before we start and look at the decade ahead and just say, uh, my belief is that archetypal astrology is actually a natural next step in the unfolding of uh, psychedelic experience, the unfolding of psycho-spiritual growth as catalyzed by psychedelic experience or even as catalyzed otherwise. And the reason being that astrology would be a, a natural kind of next step is that there is a sense that when we, we we're moving from a place of the, that life and meaning and my psychology is just inside my body and everything outside is kind of just random mechanical universe happening into a sense of, of, of seeing that, whoa, actually the universe outside and the universe inside are two sides of the same coin. Is there really an outside and an inside? So you know, me, is am, am I limited just to my body and my thoughts inside my head and my kind of biographical or my biological frame? Am I limited to that or am I the story of my life? Am I the people I've met, the places I've been to, the story, almost like you would read a novel? So are the people that I've met equally as much a part of my story me, my life story as just my body and my, you know, my, my brain basically. So is my life story actually something that takes place inside me via my emotional experiences, reactions, and also something that happens outside in the sense of all the people I meet that shape me, they are part of my life story. They are in a sense, my life talking to me. If you ever had an experience of serendipity or something, you know, like you're going to get a job and or you're looking for a job and then you meet the person who's in the field in the exact same place that you're looking for. And it's like, it feels very coordinated and orchestrated. And so, so what is, so is the identity, is my identity actually the story of my life then? The unfolding kind of entire play? All the, all the actions, all the characters, everything is, is my life unfolding. If that's the case, then when I look up at the stars, I'm also looking at myself. You know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at creation of which I am a part. And so, and also I'm, I'm experiencing that gaze at the stars from the place of my own consciousness, which seems to be the, the thing that has the entire experience couched within and so, so why then would the stars carry any meaning for us? And this, the stars do not carry necessarily in my perspective in archetypal astrology tradition, a power over us, but they do carry, they do reflect. They reflect the march of events, the, the march of movements within myself in the, the stage of my life and looking above. So there's a sense of a continuum you know, what I experience, what emotions arise, 
the, the grandeur of creation itself reflects that movement, the kind of the play of my life, the people I meet, the unfolding story, the meaning, the, the movement of the celestial bodies reflect that as well. So actually we go from a place where we talked about before of objective study of the universe as a, me a mechanistic uh, phenomenon devoid of meaning into a place of experiencing that actually meaning is the, the basis of it all, meaning and consciousness and you know the, us living our lives, being aware of ourselves and our unfolding growth as beings and our unfolding kind of engagement with, with the other, which is actually a reflection of the self, the same creation that created us, is the point. So that the, the meaning that we extract from that is actually the point. So that's the first little preamble I wanted to begin with here is that um, from the archetypal astrology perspective, astrology is actually a natural next step in the kind of, in where we're at as a species in, in, in our psycho-spiritual collective evolution. It's a very natural next step. And the other preamble I want to say is if you feel you have an inkling that you want to, that you like what you're hearing, it's a familiar music or something that is, is somehow, it's almost like smelling a scent that just somehow it attracts you or a song. You're like, I've heard, have I heard that before? You know, I really like it. And I, it sounds kind of familiar. It sounds, it sounds like something I want to you know, be reminded of or reconnect with or, or find out more about. I'm going to be teaching a course called the Fundamentals of Archetypal Astrology as a Spiritual Practice. And in that course, you have the ability to actually develop your own archetypal astrology practice. So that includes looking at transits, world transits, which is what we're doing today, which is understanding the beat and the rhythm and the themes unfolding in the world, on the world stage. It's almost like the headlines, the tone of the headlines of the news. And to be able to see that as like, it's not just, I mean, news can be something that is just kind of clickbait or something to get your attention, but there are collective um, threads of story, which actually reflect, you know, we get seized on things like things that happen in the collective, they thematically reflect in a collective way, what's happening to each of us in an individual way. And so that's world transits, personal transits, the ability to see how your own personal life unfolds, the beat, the rhythm, the themes. It's a way, it's, all, it's, like, it's like being able to understand the language, the secret language of the universe. Being able to understand the secret language of the universe and almost like the music, being able to read the music and feel the music, hear the music, developing an ear. It's like, oh, okay, I, I get the rhythm now. So now I should step forward with this foot. You know, next week I should step forward with this foot. The next three months it's going to be, it's going to have this, it's going to be in this key. It's going to be in this tone, this pitch, you know, so I can be prepared for that. And then uh, there's also going to be looking at birth charts. So if you look at somebody else's birth chart, you can help them understand their psycho spiritual path of growth. And if you look at your own birth chart, you can help them, you can help yourself, you can understand your own pace and rhythm of your own spiritual growth. So that's, that's the practice of archetypal astrology, you can use that as your map to yourself to understanding your life. So you can feel like it's like the language of your life. So you don't have to feel like a foreigner in the landscape of your own life, you can feel very flu fluent in the language secret language of the universe. So archetypal astrology, the fundamentals of archetypal astrology as a spiritual practice, I'm going to put it in the chat. And if you're watching the recording, it's going to be, you'll find a link to, and everybody who registered will also be emailed this with the recording. So now we're going to get into it. Now we're going to get into the transits. Anybody up for the transits of the next decade? Yes, no, maybe so. I want to um, uh, say that I actually welcome, um, I, I welcome questions. So if you have a question, that's okay. You, you can do that. Um, let's do slideshow. Okay, so here we are. Astrological forecast for the psychedelic renaissance 2020 through 2030. So again, we're already just to clarify, we're already in the psychedelic renaissance. This is the forecast moving forward. How is it going to unfold? Okay, so here's the page that is. Uh, yes, quick question. question there. 
Do we get a copy of these slides by any chance? Uh, you, uh, you can actually, because you registered, you gave me your email, so I can get you the, the slides as well. Because as an astrologer, I would be particularly, particularly in, interested, obviously, in the forecasts over the next 10 years. Awesome. Who, who is talking right now? Christina from Napier, New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for showing up, by the way. What time is it there? Oh, it's 11.51 a.m. Yeah, awesome. Okay, great. Yeah, I will send you the slides. Um, and that brings me to another point, another kind of preamble here, which is that um, this is from the perspective of archetypal astrology. So you're not going to hear be hearing much about the signs and the um, the signs. You're going to be hearing a lot more about the planets and the archetypes of the planets because that's what archetypal astrology focuses on. Archetypal astrology is the tradition of astrology that grew out of the psychedelic, the clinical research in psychedelics. Researchers were looking for a tool that could help them predict or at least anticipate the quality of material that would arise from the subconscious and the study participants because it was, you know, once it arose, they saw there's a healing intelligence that that heals the psyche and, and does what needs to happen with the material. Um, but they wanted to be able to get a sense beforehand of what themes might come up. They tried all different diagnostic tools and they got nowhere with the toolkit from the, the Western psychological tradition. And they tried astrology and that's what they found, gave them insight, not only into the, the ability to anticipate what material would come up from the subconscious, but also to help the study participants understand how that material ties back to the larger thematic arcs of their life. And it's, so it's like a map, it's like a roadmap or like a language, understanding the language of the, the interior psycho-spiritual unfolding. And so archetypal astrology, what they focused on was actually the planets because across all traditions of astrology, most all traditions of astrology, there's the same planets that are being looked at and mostly the same meaning is attributed to all the planets. Once you bring in the signs and the houses, you're gonna get different signs and houses uh, in different traditions. So you're gonna get a different interpretation with different traditions, but with the planets, you, you're gonna get more or less similar, similar interpretation. And not only that, that's what they found was the most insightful for using astrology as a tool to map the psycho-spiritual growth of an individual as the planets. So that's what we're gonna be seeing today. That's what we're going to be looking at mostly is the planets. Again, if you have questions, just, just shoot them out. Okay, so here we are, an astrological forecast for the psychedelic renaissance 2020 through 2030. And here we've got the first slide, which is um, going to be probably our, 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 our framework, you could say. This is our base level framework. And this is, this is looking at the next decade and to... to an extent of granularity that we can fit it into an hour and a half talk because there's a lot that goes on in the decade. So we could go into, we could really focus in the lens and go into great depth. But what I've done here is I've taken the meaty parts and pulled them out for you so that, you know, we're, the, we're not getting too granular. We're just looking at the big themes again, like the headlines. Okay. And so what we have here is we've got a bar a graph 2020 to 2030. And you can see we've got from 2020 to about 2024, we have this bar right here, which is Saturn Uranus. Again, this planets, and I'm gonna describe what that means. Second bar right here is about from 20, um, 2022 to 2023, that's Jupiter Neptune, 2024 to 2026, Saturn Neptune, and 2024 until all the way until 2030. And, they, and I think 20, even 2031, 2032, is um, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and harmonious aspect, you will be able to understand everything and momentarily what that means if this is an unfamiliar language to you. But before we get into what specifically this means in broad strokes of like almost like musical tone, what, what, we, what we have here is a beginning that uh, the Saturn Uranus is a little complicated. All, the, all, these, uh, all these combinations have their complications, their upsides and their challenges, which we'll get into. The first one though, is the one that we're already in. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And it's, it, it's 
it's it's one of the more complex uh, combinations, but one that is not um, uh, particularly soul challenging. It's just something challenging to navigate. This little blip right here, 2022, 2023, is actually um, a high. You could say like a high Jupiter Neptune, um, which has its own challenges because sometimes it can be too high. Um, but when we get into the middle of the decade, this is the Saturn Neptune right here. That's the um, that is the tricky spot. That's the the spot, the tough, the real tough soul forging time. That's twenty twenty four to twenty twenty six. And we'll talk about that. And then we go out on a note of very hopeful, of a really hopeful, uh, just excellently sublime combination here, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and harmonious aspects. So it's almost as if you were listening to a um, musical interlude or musical movement, it would start out kind of complicated and bright. That's the Saturn, Uranus, complicated, Jupiter, Neptune, bright, and then get into a, a kind of an encounter with the shadow a, a, a real tossing, churning, turning, um, uh, dark period that then kind of resolves into an even brighter episode as we get in from, uh, from the mid 2020s to 2030. So let's get into it. What does all this mean? So Saturn, Uranus, we're already in. So that one's easy to look at. That one actually began in 2020 and it goes until 2023. And so we look at the planetary archetypes and we combine them. And Saturn and Uranus are like opposite archetypes in some ways, because Saturn represents limitations, realities, obligations, limit, uh, responsibilities, laws, structures, disciplines, traditions, institutions, conservatism, certainty, maturity, authority. So Saturn, the tone there is a kind of... Um, it's a work a day, not that exciting, more discipline driven, sober quality. So it's, it's not really um, something that's going to keep you fascinated. It's more like something that's going to keep you grounded. Okay. And again, I welcome questions. You can pop in at any time. So Saturn, again, limitations, uh, the limitation of mortality being, being one of the biggest limitations that we face. You know, we all have a time limit on our life. And Saturn is associated with deadlines, could be any deadline, you know, any project has a deadline, the limitations of time, the realities of time, the realities of existence, we all have responsibilities and obligations, there are laws, laws exist, structures exist, it takes discipline to obey laws, there's traditions and institutions, laws give a sense of certainty, and in order to kind of master ourselves and 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 how carry our own rule of law within it requires maturity and inner authority these are all saturnian things so uranus is the archetype of rebellion revolution breakthrough innovation fickleness uncertainty excitement liberalism recklessness freedom liberation so uranus as an archetype is definitely exciting there's nothing kind of work a day about it it's it has to do with breakthroughs it has to do with the eureka moments, the flashes of insight, but it doesn't have that groundedness of Saturn. It doesn't have that um, maturity of Saturn. It's kind of um, like it can be fickle, it can be reckless, but at the same time, life would be too boring without it. You know, the Uranus archetype is the archetype that keeps the, 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 the keeps the world revolving, revolutions, um, uh, f freedom, you know, freedom from the, the, the humdrum. So the Saturnian humdrum reality and freedom from that. But if we have too much freedom from kind of the everyday schedule of life, that in and of itself can be a challenge. If we have too much humdrum, you know, everyday work a day, that can be its own challenge. So now we've entered into a time in which these two are in what's called a tense alignment, a square alignment, and they are really seeking to have a conversation with themselves via us. We are the vehicles through which these energies reconcile. And so we, as a world population, are trying to reconcile these energies. How does it show up? I mean, it obviously showed up. Um, it obviously showed up in 2020 because, you know, laws and freedom was one of the main themes there, you know, like restriction and caution around the pandemic versus personal freedoms. And, you know, the ability to move freely, that was just, 
I mean, like part of the everyday conversation. How else has it showed up? So um, these are ways that Saturn Uranus can show up. Rebellion within the law. So rebelling against the, the, the status quo structures through the, uh, through the channels of the law. Freedom within structure. That's Saturn Uranus. Maturity before revolution. So the mature revolution. The breakthrough that takes time and patience. Tension between the old and the new. Tension between innovation and tradition. And the sudden shakeup of old structures. So if we're talking about psychedelic therapy, I mean, how many of these little buttons here hit on point thematically with what's going on with psychedelic therapy? We have the FDA, the law, the structure. We have the breakthrough therapy status, the very Uranian breakthrough therapy status and how that breakthrough that takes time and patience, the, the application of Saturn through time and patience has led to this Uranian ability to have a breakthrough therapy. So we see how maturity and patience and sobriety has led to a kind of a, a, a housing and a structure for the Uranian lightning bolt of, of awakening and, and, and eureka moments that come with psychedelic therapy. So we began the talk today talking about how through the 80s and 90s, you know, some entities just carried forth, you know, even though psychedelics were legal, they just did the hard slog of trying to get the, front, the groundwork laid for this psychedelic uh, renaissance that's happening now. And so the Saturn Uranus is coming through in a positive way in that sense, you know, all that hard work is leading to freedom. Um, though that's not the, there, there's still a tension there. There's still a conversation there. Let's look at, um, let's look at it here. So examples, we can see not just in the, in, in psychedelic therapy, but in the world, how these have shown up. We've got the British uh, monarchy. That's a very kind of blatant example of it, how there's the tradition, the kind of the time tested tradition of the British monarchy. And then there's these Uranian elements, Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, shaking it up. Um, and then we've got innovation, tech, innovative technologies, disrupting infrastructure, you know, hacking, ransomware, things like that. There's infrastructure grids, power grids, um, different types of infrastructure grids that getting attacked, technology, innovation. So again, there's like structure and, and innovation and technology, the Uranian kind of breakthroughs in a conversation there. Shakeups of structures, literal shakeups of structures like the Surfside condo collapse in Miami. We see that a lot um, with when Uranus and Saturn are in, um, in combination like this, that where, where there's too much Saturn, or, or too much Uranus, uh, the other one comes in as a countermeasure. And if it's just too far gone in, 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 in a Saturnian or Uranian direction, the other one comes in like a hit and something breaks. Uh, Joe Rogan just had a quote, which I just had up here, but I actually uh, closed the window about all the breaks and break, breaking bones that have happened recently in the, in the UFC mixed martial arts. Um, so yeah, so the Surfside collapse and con the, the condo collapse, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, again, structures cracking up. And then again, just bringing it back to psychedelic therapy, old talk therapy versus new psychedelic therapy. Again, we've got tradition, right? And we've got the new, the breakthrough innovation. And there's, there's a conversation happening there and people are, we're, we're trying, you know, we're, we're out here doing the work. These archetypes don't do themselves. They are us, they are us, we are them. And the conversation, the evolution is the churning and the reconciling of these energies together. Um, and then the integration of psychedelic therapy into the laws of this world is very Saturn Uranus because um, you know it's just like, is this really happening? The psychedelics are being legalized. It's so amazing because they're so Uranian, they're so revolutionary but yet they're being integrated into the laws. That's very Saturnian, something that's very institutional, traditional. Wow, that's really happening. So here we are, we're in that combination there. I'm gonna move on to the next combination, um, but before I do, I'm gonna stop sharing here and just, um, just check in with y'all. Um, so how are we doing? Any questions on that one on Saturn Uranus? No? All right, let's dive back in then. 
I'm gonna look at the next combination here. And let's do it. Uh, let's do a slideshow. Okay, so um, we have Jupiter Neptune. So Saturn Uranus again is 2020, 2023. Okay, and it's really at its height in 2021. So we are in that conversation happening right now very quite strongly. Um, the Jupiter Neptune is 2022 and Jupiter Neptune is a quicker transit. It's only 2022, <clears throat> but it's one that on the outset is oftentimes quite welcome because of the positive uplifting nature of the transit. So Jupiter is associated with the heights, the expansion ideals, abundance, success, possibility. This is the Jupiterian, the planetary archetype of Jupiter. Optimism, higher learning, travel, enrichment. Oh, it has a challenging side though. Overexpansion, superabundance, overinflation, corpulence. The Ju Jupiter is the largest planet and the archetype of Jupiter is associated with this kind of growth and um, expansiveness. And it's very optimistic, buoyant is associated with the high ideals, the high culture, um, the higher learning, the, the travel, um, and very optimistic. And that's wonderful, that's great. Um, and it has its own challenges as well. They're a little harder to see, but we'll get into those. Neptune, the archetype of Neptune is associated with disillusion, the infinite realms. Neptune was the god of the sea, in ancient Greco-Roman mythology, the infinite sea, the infinite sky, the infinite dream realm, spiritual realm, imagination, collective unconscious, the well of archetypal imagery from which inspiration comes and artists gain their inspiration. Neptune is associated with enchantment and its challenging sides have to do with illusion and over idealization. Okay, so when we get these two together, Jupiter, Neptune, we generally have a good time. We have a good time. We have the expansivity, the expansiveness of Jupiter with the Neptunian enchantment. And here are some examples, expanding upon the dream, expanding Jupiter, the dream, Neptune, an abundance of spiritual bliss. Again, abundance, Jupiter, spiritual bliss, Neptune. Travels to archetypal realms, travels, Jupiter, that enrichment and expansive, expanding oneself to incorporate more of the outer world. Archetypal realms, Neptune. Enchantment and optimism. Enchantment, Neptune, optimism, Jupiter. Now, these are this is where the challenges come in. Overblown idealization. It can be a year when there's Jupiter, Neptune can be a high flying year in which we're very high, but then once it's over, and time moves on, we feel a little bit like our bubble got burst because we look back at what we actually manifested and we could be a little disappointed in what we see because of a castle in the sky type of quality that can come with Jupiter Neptune. It's so expansive, it's so visionary, it's an optimistic, a high idealized vision, um, but the practical application is, is at times lacking. Um, it's, it can be an overinflated spiritual vision. That being said, one of the wonderful things about archetypal astrology, we began the talk today talking about the secret, tuning into the secret language of the universe. If we know this is coming up, we know this is coming up in 2022, we can anticipate it and we can, we can welcome it. We can say, we know you, we know you characters, who you are. We know what dance Jupiter Neptune does. And we say, okay, here's the bliss. Here's the optimism. And we know it's temporary and we know it's going to get overblown at times. Let's not take it too seriously, but let's enjoy it at least while it's here. Okay. So let's look at some examples of Jupiter Neptune so you can know it. So you can know that tone, that, that music, you know, that song when it comes up, you're like, Oh, I know what to do with the song. I just enjoy it. And I don't expect too much from it in the end, because I know it's just going to be a, a nice breeze that blows through and it's gone when it's gone. So examples, these are Michael Jackson. These are people born with Jupiter and Neptune. So Michael Jackson, uh, Never Never Land, very Jupiter Neptune. He owned his own theme park, which was Never Never Land. I mean, Never Never Land is, could hardly be, you can hardly think of a better place, better name 
for Jupiter and Neptune because it's just so perfect. You know, it's this perfect heavenly fantasy. Um, so Michael Jackson, Elon Musk, and Jim Henson. With Jupiter and Neptune, you oftentimes have a visionary component, the, ab the ability to take the Neptunian inspiration, the Neptunian well of archetypal imagery and mythological zest and inspiration and just expand it into a vision uh, through the Jupiterian expansiveness that allows us to have something to move towards. It allows a vision for the future or a vision of the imagination that is very inspiring for us. Elon Musk has done that in the sense of there's a sense of the human race moving in a direction because there's this kind of expansive vision of what's possible, human potential. And then Jim Henson had the same kind of visionary quality, but he uh, created movies and shows and, and puppets that created these lands, these, these fantasy lands that were so inspiring. You know, it could be an escape. It could get you to a place where you are able to actually be in touch with another enchanting reality. The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, his movies like that. Snoop Dogg and Bob Marley, both born with Jupiter and Neptune, high all the time. You know, the sense of, you know, the ability to just, just be high, you know, just smoke marijuana, be high, have the sense of kind of like, it's almost integrated into their identity of just highness, you know, um, and a positivity as well. Erica Badu, born with it. We got a quote from her. I consider my musical ability to be a gift from the creator. It's not that I tr try to work hard or nothing like that. It's a gift. It was given to me and I appreciate it. Very Jupiter Neptune. Franklin D. Roosevelt, we have always held to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. You can hardly get more Jupiter Neptune than that. So if you have, you know, you have slated in your to-do list visioning, you know, that you, you, you know that you got to do some visioning about what's possible in your life. You know, you can look at 2022 as a great year for visioning, as we can see from this uh, this combination here. Okay, so <clears throat> in terms of the psychedelic movement, um, it can be a very hopeful time. It can be a time of feeling like, wow, we've really, we've really done this like a big party. Um, and just be aware, just be aware. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're here today, being informed. Just be aware, be aware of of the quality of Jupiter and Neptune and know that yes, it's there is a time to celebrate. There's a time to make a vision for the future. There's a time to celebrate what's here. And um, that optimistic buoyancy is, it is what it is and let's enjoy it while it's there, but it's, it's not always gonna be that way. It's gonna create a big bubble. It's gonna make, it's gonna make sometimes things seem like we've reached utopia, um, but time has changed. So let's look at the next combination. Speaking of time is change. <clears throat> okay, so the next combination. Uh, so I'm going to go back here in the, to the very beginning of the talk. So here, so if you remember, we, we talked in the very beginning about Saturn Uranus, which is the integration of psychedelics into the law and the, the balance between tradition and the past and the future and innovation, tradition, past, Saturn, future, innovation, breakthroughs, Uranus. And then we've got this blip here of Jupiter, Neptune, which is really optimistic. That's 2022. And then if you remember me mentioning, if this were a song, a, a musical movement, it would have in its center, the challenging dip into the encounter with the soul forging, you know, the, the dip into the shadow where things suddenly get real. It's almost like a to be honest, this span looks to me like a journey. It looks to me like a psychedelic journey and a classic kind of kind of mapping of a psychedelic journey. Because in the beginning, there's a kind of a mix up, the, the old structures within ourselves, the old ego structures, and the new breakthroughs that are trying to happen get into kind of like a little wrestling match and we get, you know, oftentimes people entering into psychedelic journeys feel mixed up at first. They begin to kind of lose their measurements of reality as they knew it. And they, you know, they just get, it's the shake up in the very beginning. And then we can go into a, an experience of feeling high, feeling high, feeling euphoric. That's the Jupiter Neptune, that's 2022. From here, we get into 
uh, the Saturn Neptune, and that can be like the part of the trip where suddenly we take a dip and we start to go down into, um, we start to, or material starts to come up and it's like, oh, here's what we came here to do. Here's the work. It's not all just being high. You know, here's the work. Here's where we, we as my teacher Rick Tarnas says, forge our souls. Here's the time where we, it's the reckoning time. And then we go through the reckoning time in the middle of the journey. And then as it tapers, it goes into a kind of an integration bliss moment where, where the integration is happening. So this, this, this graph here looks to me very much like a journey. So the point that we've gotten to now is the Saturn Neptune, which is the real meat of the challenge of the experience. So Saturn Neptune, that's 2025 and 2026. We know what Saturn is. Saturn is limitations, realities, obligations, responsibilities, laws, structures, disciplines, traditions, institutions, conservatism, certainty, maturity, authority. All these things that are heavy. And Saturn is associated, we, we talked about the limitations of mortality, um, that life is finite and things can get heavy. Reality is real. You know, reality is real. And there are real consequences to our actions. That's Saturn. That's why Saturn is associated with karma. You know, there's real, re there's real consequences to our actions. Um, and they can, they can hit hard. They can be really heavy. They can have gravity, gravitas. It's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's reality is real. You know, we gotta, we, we gotta just get with that. And then we get into Neptune, the disillusion, the infinite realms, the spiritualization, the dreams, the imagination, inspiration, the collective unconscious, the imagery, the archetypes, the myths, the, the enchantment. So when Saturn and Neptune get together, we can oftentimes feel that the dream has been eclipsed by the reality. Okay. The dream has been eclipsed by the reality. The dream has been eclipsed by the duty and the responsibility. That's Saturn. The dream has been eclipsed by the consequences of previous actions. That's Saturn. So ways that this can show up, um, any ways that, that we as a collective may have been sloppy about bringing in the Neptunian realm of enchantment, the Neptunian realm of the archetypal enchanted realm of spirit into our reality and our laws and our structures and our everyday ordinary life, wherever we've been sloppy about that, wherever we've, we've overindulged in escapism, Neptune as escapism into dreams, into imagination that is not real, it doesn't have a real application, we will feel the consequences of that at this time. This is 2025, 2026. And um, it shows up in any different number of ways. Obviously, we're talking about psychedelic therapy here. So that would show up as, um, you know, the consequences wherever we have been sloppy and not, you know, demonstrate maturity in psychedelic therapy, the consequences will come up and it can feel as if the vision has been tarnished. The vision has been taken down or eclipsed by the reality. It can feel that way, but actually what's happening is that there's a deeper reality being forged. There's a different quality. There's a through the test of this time and the sobering of this time, uh, we, the real work is done. The real work of, of integrating spirit into reality is, and, and all the, the, the divine realizations and wisdom of the divine encounter, bringing that into reality, you know, it actually comes from facing up, you know, stepping up and, 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 and facing our, you know, where we've been, we've been, we haven't been responsible enough. We haven't been mature enough. So that's the way it can show up in psychedelic therapy, but there there's these, these combinations are not just limited psychedelic therapy. It's, you know, when, when some, when these, these uh, alignments are active, it's reflective of a quality pan, like over the entire earth, pan earth, if that's a term over the entire earth. So um, like examples would be, um, uh, like for instance, in 2005 to 2007, we had a Saturn Neptune that was a square at that time. And in 2025, we'll be entering into a conjunction, but either way, the alignments activate the two together. 
And so in 2025, 20, uh, in 2005, it, it kicked it off with the Hurricane Katrina and the flooding of New Orleans and the sense of this kind of, um, you know, New Orleans is the very Jupiter Neptune place. You know, this Saturn Neptune's coming after Jupiter Neptune. Remember that the high Jupiter Neptune, and then we get into Saturn Neptune. Uh, uh, um, New Orleans is a Jupiter Neptune place. You know, people go there to get high. You know, Mardi Gras, Bourbon Street. Um, and that was just such a sobering time. You know, the, the waters came in, they were so toxic um, that you, you, you get that with Saturn, Neptune, because Neptune is the pure waters and Saturn is the hard reality. And the hard reality is the toxic waters. Um, and it, it's reminiscent for those of you that are familiar with the work of Stan Groff, the psychedelic pioneer, pioneering researcher who came up with the basic perinatal matrices. It's associated with the birth trauma that has to do with um, being in the womb of the mother when toxic toxins are, are brought into the womb either through alcohol or, or drugs or some type of environmental toxin or toxic emotions rejection you know something like that so there's a sense of the 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 ideal dream just becomes washed out by the the hard reality um so it's new orleans that same during that same transit was the the, the lead contamination in, in the area of detroit does anybody remember that the um and that's very Saturn, Neptune as well, the water contaminated by Saturn. The water in psychedelic therapy is, is the, the connection to the divine and Saturn shows up as the, um, you know, the reality of, are we really that, are, are we like, it's a test, it's a test to see how mature we are in our, in our encounter with the divine within and in our spiritual unfolding. Um, interestingly, looking at people that were born with um with these combinations elon musk and jim henson so you'll remember elon musk and jim henson were met, mentioned in the previous combination of jupiter neptune jupiter neptune the hopeful the hopeful blissful dream and then the dream um that is subjected to the hard reality saturn neptune so both of those both elon musk and jim henson were born with both combinations with Jim Henson, we see it in his, you know, he created these fantasy realms that were the dream uh, was expansive, but he did it through hard work. He actually created these puppets by hand where there's actual structures, Saturnian structures and bones and frameworks and, you know, like backbreaking labor that went into the work that he created. Very Saturn Neptune, you know, he really had to forge with his blood and tears and sweat these visions. So very Saturn Neptune with Elon Musk as well. The vision is there, um, you know, the spacefaring civilization and the the humanity that is that has uh, you know the renewable energy and technology as a kind of a celebration. Um, but you know he's an engineer, and it's it, it's he's a lot of what he builds is, is is structures, you know, structures, tunnels, and everything is 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 very you know it's got to be correct that the, the structuring has to be in line with the laws of physics and the realities of the situation or it's not going to work the vision will not come into reality so saturn neptune and jupiter neptune are there with both of them elon musk and jim henson anthony kiedis lead singer of red hot chili peppers born with saturn neptune so we can there's actually on youtube there's a really um there's a, a quote from, there's a little interview of him when he was very young talking about the oceans and how um, you can see the Saturn Neptune there because he talks about how the oceans are exploited and polluted and, and how he wants to put in the work to reclaim the, the spiritual, you know, majesty of the oceans. You know, Neptune is the ocean and the spiritual majesty and, and Saturn is the hard reality of what's really happening. And, and Saturn also is the hard work to reclaim that beauty and majesty of the oceans. Sasha Shulgin, Alexander Shulgin, the famed chemist who synthesized mescaline and MDMA. And interestingly, he may have been born with Saturn Neptune. We don't know his time of birth, which, um, you know, kind of configures in because the Saturn Neptune is a little wide, but the moon is there. So it's, it's most likely a Saturn Neptune conjunction. And for him as well, we can see how Saturn Neptune is there because he was a hard working chemist. He created these substances or he synthesized these substances, which create a very Jupiter Neptune experience, you know, the heights, the highs, um, 
but he did it through that hard work, you know, the hard work of, of the realities of chemistry. I mean, he was a genius in chemistry and, and he's just such a hard worker, you know, so he did it just manually, like um, that's the Saturn Neptune, you know, just putting in that slog, that daily work day to day to create the, the, the vision, Neptune. Um, so you'll notice that as we mapped uh, 2020, we've gone up to about 2026, and even, even beyond, we've looked at how the arc of the entire decade is almost like a journey. It's almost like, you know, it goes in with a Saturn Uranus kind of disrupting the senses, changing things up. Then Jupiter Neptune, the high, and Saturn Neptune, which is actually the low, the encounter with, you know, really having to wrestle reality and the dream back into a new synthesis. And then the, the integration component at the end. And so, this the reason why I describe Saturn. The reason why, that I describe the, the this decade as a journey is because although these transits talk about how the entire stage of the world is going to be, the themes of the entire stage of the world, the themes the 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 world stage will be trying to reconcile. It's also going to inflect down to the individual. So this is going to land somewhere in your birth chart these aspects are going to land somewhere in your birth chart. And so you are also that that is going to be inflected down into your life. Um, you know, the, the Jupiter Neptune time, the highs, the Saturn Neptune time, the, the, the reconciling with the reality. So this is this is applicable to our personal life too. you know, when it comes to 2022, enjoy the highs, but we don't want to get too high. So that when the reckoning comes in Saturn Neptune from 2024 to 2026, we don't have to pay the piper. We don't have to pay. Uh, we don't have to, um, you know, just pay the hard consequences for where we went too. We went too expansive into a bubble of lacking reality in 2022. Okay, so let's look at the next combination here. Um, this is the Uranus Neptune Pluto in harmonious aspect. Okay, so the this is three, this is three planets here, and they are in what's called harmonious aspect. It means that the alignment that they will go into will not be tense. It will be harmonious. And this is a wonderful combination. This really is a wonderful combination. And we have it for almost, almost a decade. You know, it goes from 2020, um, when is it, 2024 to in, into the early 2030s. A little bit more challenging to describe because there's three archetypes involved. Um, but if we're just going to bring in Pluto, because we already talked about Uranus, we already talked about Neptune, just to bring in Pluto so you know, Pluto is associated with deep transformation, mystery in the hidden, total annihilation, rebirth, purification by fire, catharsis. The challenges of Pluto have to be obsession and power struggles. There's Pluto is associated with instincts and the driving will of life. So Pluto is kind of uh, well illustrated in the action of a volcano, this kind of instinctual, just elemental eruption from the earth, which transforms the landscape, destroys, but in the service of rebirthing a new landscape. That's the archetype of Pluto. Pluto though here in harmonious aspect um, is not as destructive. So it's, it's when it's there with Uranus and Neptune, Pluto and Uranus, when they are in tense alignments, those are the periods where um, the Uranian breakthroughs in technology were driven by the universal will, the driving will of life. Um, and so during those periods, you know, technology gets like driven almost to an obsessive elemental powerful extent. That's when we visited the moon, the 1960s. Um, that's in the, the last decade ending about now, um, the all everything that happened then in terms of revisiting space and, and all the technology and all the advancements made in the, in the past decade, but also um, Uranus liberates the driving evolutionary power of, of Pluto. And so there's a sense of, um, you know, during those periods, the human race kind of evolving this like this, this is almost like an accelerated evolving time, the civil rights movement, sexual liberation, 
Um, those were there in the 60s. Those were there in the past decade, you know, like whereas in the 60s, we had Martin Luther King and um, Malcolm X. And in, 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 in the 2010s, we had, you know, Obama. And so the civil rights movement kind of it's when the, when the coming to heart alignment is kind of like the next chapter and whatever the themes were of the previous chapter. That's the hard alignment. It's entering into a soft alignment now. Um, so, and then it's also in a soft alignment with Neptune. So during these periods of soft alignments between these three planets, we tend to have an ease of the themes of the planets just integrating with each other. Um, romanticism is the is the great example of when they're all in soft alignment. That was like the um, 1770s, I believe. Um, Period, a period when romanticism began, maybe 1750s, 60s, 70s. Um, and, you know, it's just the, the, the flowering of culture, the flowering of, um, of, of, of poetry, of, of artistry. It was a really very special time. Um, and then the people that are born with that alignment will, when they come to maturity, carry that energy forward as well. So we've got, you know, Beethoven, Coleridge, Wor Wor Wordsworth, Napoleon, so many, um, you know, really important figures in history that carried that energy forward. And it's just, I mean, it's just a time like, you know, when you, even the name romanticism and when people think of it, they oftentimes think of like, for instance, the literature and the poetry, just so inspiring, such an inspiring time. And so one way we can think of that is if, you know, where the tail end of a journey is a time of inspiration for many people, you know, after having gone through the highs, but also the lows, the challenges of coming out the other side and the integrating period and feeling inspired, seeing how one can apply this newfound openness and, and, and openness of the heart and, and inspiration. And in terms of specific themes during this time, um, when, those, when any of these planets are, in, are in, in, in alignment with each other, we have a number of, of, of happenings that are listed here, like the birth of psychology, the birth of psychedelic therapy, civil rights, sexual liber liberty, space aviation, so because of the harmonious aspect, oftentimes these aspects of cultural development go through a kind of an easy unfolding of their production, as opposed to, you know, when they're in hard alignment, like the 1960s, a kind of a tumultuous, a tumultuous uh, kind of like almost like earthquake of, of reconciling these energies. Now it's a kind of an easy just they it's it doesn't take as much effort you know it's just as if we're, we're kind of moving with the waters we're kind of in a canoe and we're just going with the or on a surfboard and we're surfing the wave we're just going with where evolution wants to take us and that's what's so beautiful about this 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 combination it's so hopeful i'm very excited that it's coming up i'm very excited to be alive as it's coming up i'm very excited to take part of it i'm very excited to see how it lands in my personal birth chart I'm very excited to see how it lands in your personal birth charts, what it means for your life and your unfolding, because your life and your unfolding is actually the collective unfolding. The collective unfolding happens within our individual consciousness. We look out, we open our eyes to the world and we see the collective unfolding, but it can't happen without being couched in our individual consciousness, you know, in a relationship to an I, to a me, and my personal unfolding. And so, it's just such a wonderful, you know, now that we're in the psychedelic renaissance, we can just imagine how this harmonious aspect is going to, is going to play out once we reach it, because, you know, we can already see the kind of insights and artistic inspiration and cultural inspiration and technological advancements that are coming out of this opening to plant medicine, to psychedelic therapy, to healing, to inner psycho-spiritual growth and awakening. So just imagine how that will suffuse the culture through the latter half of the decade. We can imagine, you know, it's, 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 but we know, again, it's like recognizing notes of music. We know the tone, we know the beat, the pace, the rhythm. We, we, we know the artists that are involved. Maybe we don't know the song, but we know the composers. We know Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. And so we know it's going to be good. We know it's going to generally have this quality that we're familiar with now. And, uh, and, 
you know, then when it comes, we get to celebrate, we get to recognize that we get to celebrate, oh, look, Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto are wearing these new clothes now. Look at how vibrant they are. You know, look at, you know, that's the universe revels in novelty. It's going to be new. We've never encountered it before, but it's the same, the same archetypes as always, but in a new configuration. Because we're in this period of awakening, it's bound to be filled with zeal and, and, and so inspiring. And um, so on that hopeful note, I am beginning to wind down our look at the decade. Um, let me see if I got any other slides for you. Nope, that's it. So um, I'm open for questions now, if anybody has questions about the decade ahead and how the unfolding of the decade ahead. Hopefully it's left you with a positive note. Hopefully it's left you with some kind of um, familiar terrain to map it onto. You know, I use that, that sense of an individual journey, how the, the, the shape of an individual journey to help if you had experience with psychedelic healing to understand the kind of the arc of the themes of this year. All right, so let's see. Sounds awesome, thank you. Are there specific peaks for 2022 with Jupiter and Neptune? Oh, you know what? I didn't even, I do have other things to show. Let me share my screen again. Um, so here's another way of looking at um, everything. Here's another way of looking at the transits. So um, this is what's called Archetypal Explorer. And so we talked about, um, I am gonna definitely answer your question, Heather, about Jupiter and Neptune. I'm just gonna give a little bit of a description of what we're looking at here in terms of Archetypal Explorer. So I pulled up all the timelines of the four different combinations that we started the talk with today so that you can see in Archetypal Explorer, this software here, you can, you can see them just in a different way, a different graphic, and it can be very helpful. So for instance, the Saturn Uranus, the shakeup of structures that we're currently in, you can see how it began in 2020 and 20, between 2021 and 2022 are the real peaks. And then it's there till 2023 and then it kind of fades out. We go into the Jupiter Neptune and this is 2022. So here's the start of 2022 and this is 2023. So it's mostly confined to 2022 and we can see how April's the real height. Um, and so there's that, you know, that hopefully that answers your question. That's the real peak. You know, we've got a real peak around April and then we have another um, bump around, what is that? Like November, December. Um, and then we go into um, that beautiful combination. Actually, let's look at the Saturn Neptune, the real, the, the encounter with the shadow. Um, and that is between 2025, it's 2025 through 2026. So all of 2025, all of 2026. And we can see that it really, you know, 2025 is gonna be the hard reckoning. You know, that's the real height right there. This, this graph where it says zero, that's the exactitude of alignment. Um, so we can see that it gets exact in 2025. So that's 2025 is the time of, uh, that's the, that's the wake up call. And that's the time to forge our, um, our connection to spirit. You know, we really get tested in terms of our connection to spirit when the hard realities come, because sometimes there's an association of the heights and the bliss and the connection with spirituality with the avoidance of hard times and the encounter with only positive uplifting experiences. But a Saturn Neptune time is going to challenge us to encounter a bedrock of spiritual connection in the hard reality. A perfect example of this is, is um, after the Civil War, the American Civil War, in the Gettysburg Address by, by Abraham Lincoln. That was a Saturn Neptune time. You know, at the end of the war, the war was 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 getting won, but you know, the loss is just completely demoralizing. The loss of human life is completely demoralizing. It just the dream of that they're fighting for has to be cast in the lens of this absolutely um, demoralizing loss of life. And so anyways, there's the Getty, Gettysburg Address in which, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln says, he says, you know, I can't, I can't, he, go, he, he, he gives the talk over the battlefield, if I understand correctly, 
where the life was lost, you know, like where the bodies are laying. And he says, you know, I can't consecrate these grounds and neither can you. The only people that consecrate these grounds are the soldiers that fought and lost their lives. You know, they gave their lives for the dream. And it's only through the ultimate loss that the dream was forged. And that's as about as Saturn Neptune as you can get. <laughs> that's about as Saturn Neptune as you can get. The realities are very real. And that's when we encounter the true reality of, of awakening, spiritual awakening. And so, so here we are, the Saturn Neptune 2025, all of 2025, all of 2026, the height being in 2025. So again, be aware of that. And then here we go to the final, um, the final combo there, the three Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in harmonious aspect. So you can see this, this, this one represents the Neptune sextile Pluto. This one represents the Uranus trine Pluto. And this one is the uh, Uranus sextile Neptune. That's all to say they're all in harmonious aspect. And they really, you know, it's quite low over here. It really kicks in around 2024. And it goes, you know, it goes all the way to about 2030, 2031. But it's really in this height here between 2025, 2026, and 2029 that, um, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I don't have words to, um, to paint the picture of what it could be like, but I just want to build a sense of appreciation. I want to anticipate a sense of appreciation or lay a groundwork for a sense of appreciation ahead of time, because it really is a, 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 an amazing combination. And um, and there's, there's one other combination I didn't mention here, which is a Saturn-Pluto combination in 2029 at the end of the decade. That's, a, that's another challenging transit, but, you know, I'm not going to go into a depth in it here. Um, that's another hit, hard hit of reality in 2029. Um, but generally speaking, all those, those, those are the kind of the major headlines that I, that I mentioned there. And, you know, many thanks to Archetypal Explorer um, for, you know, illustrating these so well. Let's see if there's any other questions. Does anybody else have questions for us? Questions about the decade ahead? Comments, any comments? Again, if you're interested in learning this, this language, this language of the universe so that the universe kind of, you know, the reality no longer speaks in tongues, you know, you can actually converse, be conversant with the divine orchestration of life. I've got this course coming up, Fundamentals of Archetypal Astrology as a Spiritual Practice. It's going to be an adventure of spiritual, psycho-spiritual growth of you, and it's going to be a journey of a lifetime. So I invite you to that. Joe says, thanks so much for this. Um, James, can you briefly touch on the difference between the stars, planets having power over us versus meaning for us that you mentioned in the intro? Um, regarding the archetypal perspective on our relationship to astrological movements. Okay, so Joe's right. In the intro, what I mentioned was that the, in archetypal astrology, the perspective on watching the celestial movements alongside the movements of humanity in, here on Earth, and even the movements of our own psycho-spiritual growth within our psycho-spiritual structure, is reflective. It's just reflective. It's not that they are determining anything for us. They are just marching in step with us. You know, it's just like my teacher Rick Tarnas uses the example of a clock. You know, a clock is not imposing time upon us. It's nearly indicating time for us. So, um, so yeah, there's no, we have all the agency, all the agency is within you because when you look out, you're looking at yourself, you know, you're looking that's the beauty of the trick of the light that consciousness does. You know, the individual seems very separate from the world, but actually the consciousness of the individual is the stage upon which the, the unfolding storyline of life plays out. And that is, um, it's, it's all us. We are, you know, we are the whole inflected through the individual in the specific. Um, second question is, I appreciate the hopeful look of anticipation of the decade ahead, but how can we apply a look at the decade long trajectory to our daily, monthly, yearly lives? I find it difficult to think in present tangible terms, 10 or even five years into the future. 
Okay, so um, how can we apply a look at the decade long trajectory to our daily, monthly, yearly lives? So the, the way that we would do that is we would actually, um, we would actually look at personal transits. So you would take the world transits and see how they land in your own chart. And that would help us get a sense of, when we look at the outer planet, so here's something to understand. So everything that we looked at today is pretty much could be termed outer planets. You know, they're, they're pretty far out in the order of the planets, Jupiter being the closest in. What was discovered in the practice of archetypal astrology was that the psychedelics were able to reveal the transpersonal nature at the base of the human experience. Now, what does that mean? The human experience is an experience of an individual ego kind of adrift in a world that appears different from it. But through, through psychedelic experience and through any type of depth spiritual practice and, and encounter and inward exploration, we find that if we go deep in us, enough within us, we encounter a base in which our own personal experience actually attaches to collective experiences, transpersonal, transcends the personal. There's a touching point within our being where we connect with the transpersonal, the, the, the experience of, you know, in psychedelic experience, it could be, you know, I experienced the consciousness of a bird. I experienced the consciousness of a snake. You know, this is not something that I have within my body. I was never a snake in this biographical life. You know, in the life of James, since I was born until now, I was never a snake. I was never a bird. Um, you know, in psychedelic experience, we can experience past lives. We can experience um, just all different modes of consciousness that are beyond the limit of, of, of space and place, which is the body and time, which is the present, and even our biographical memories of the past, you know, we can transcend that. And so in psychedelic experience, there was a discovery that there's a transcendent, there's a transpersonal level to human experience. And then the most recent outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, which were discovered not too far back, were discovered to be reflective of the deeper, the deeper we look into space, the deeper it reflects of the inner space within us. And so those outer planets were, were, became known as the transpersonal planets because they reflected in a birth chart or in transits where our personal experience connects to transpersonal experience. And that was very obvious in psychedelic experience because you can look at, you have a Neptune transit going on and then a, a transpersonal experience happens that's very Neptunian. So the, 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 the movement of Neptune is reflecting a movement within and they're both transpersonal. They're both reflective of um, that which transcends the personal identity. And so, um, you know, or Pluto or Uranus. So with that in mind, everything we've looked at today has been outer planets. So outer planets, they move slowly and they describe larger arcs of time. Okay, that's why we looked at a decade. But even you and your personal transits, when you look at the outer planets, where they, they transit your birth chart, they also describe larger periods of time. And that's why we can look back at our own lives and we can see kind of like these epochs in our lives. We can see like, oh, this decade had that quality. These five years had that quality. These two years, three years, four years, five years had that quality to it. And we can see like, oh, you know, I can see I'm going into a period of artistic inspiration. I can see I'm going into, you know, maybe I'm enrolling in a mass in a PhD program. I can see I'm going into a period of discipline and hard work. Um, I can see, so those transits are good. You know, those outer planet transits, we look at it, we can get a sense of five years. We, I mean, not that, you know, it's just, we've got it all figured out, but we get a sense of the tone of the rhythm of larger, I don't know, you would know more than, than I would, Joe, in terms of this, but musical scales, like, you know, there's probably larger type of signatures or movements of music that are in the background that are kind of larger. And then there's these other periods that are smaller and more intricate. And so the, the outer planets are those larger background movements. Um, they're, they're, they're helpful either way. You know, we look at a Saturn transit, we get a sense of a kind of maybe a two, three year period of our life. You know, that's, that, you know, it's helpful. It's helpful to know about that. If we wanna know about the week, 
the month or even just one year, we would look at the inner planets. We would look at the transits of the inner planets, which I, I didn't talk about today because they move so quickly that they wouldn't be applicable to a decade. But we talk about the inner planets and we look at how they, what's called aspect or transit, your natal chart, how they move around your, your natal chart. And that gives us a sense of the rhythm of the dance of the more immediate week. You know, like when, when do we want to plan a talk? When do I want to plan a talk like this one? When do I want to plan a date? You know, when do I want to, um, <clears throat> like, when is it a good time to go on a trip? You know, like, not that I have to micromanage my own life, but it's just enjoyment, actually. It's a celebration of marveling, like, oh, this is a good archetypal combination. I can see it's going to have themes that have to do with socializing. So let's see what happens when, around socializing. And the time comes and it starts socializing. Oh, look, this is how it's showing up. And I anticipated it. I didn't have to micromanage it, but I also didn't make other plans. I didn't plan to not socialize, you know, and I, and I, I, I welcome it with open arms because I kind of anticipate it. You know, it's like anticipating when the chorus is going to come or the bridge or something. You're like, oh, there it is. Um, so that's, that's how we get a sense of the, the more immediate, you know, the more immediate times, you know, the weeks, the months, even the days. We look at the moon, we look at the transits of the moon, we can get a sense of just three hour blocks. You know, moon move, moves quickly. So we could just get a sense of our moods, you know, we can get a sense of three hour blocks and when we're planning journeys, that is, um, that's also very helpful too, to look at, you know, the transits for that day and even the transits of the moon, because, you know, when we're going through a journey, if it's going to be six hours long or nine hours long or whatever it is, you know, we can, we can get a sense of the rhythm of it looking at the transits of the moon. And sometimes we can plan accordingly. We can plan so that the transits of the moon are nice at the end. And we end up breaking bread with community. We end up integrating back into a nice warm environment. That's, that's another practical application of archetypal astrology is the planning of psychedelic sessions. Um, any other questions? I have actually a course called Astrological Maps for Inner Journeys, and that will be up on my website as well. And through that, you can learn how to plan and understand psychedelic journeys using archetypal astrology. Yes, any further questions? Joe, was that helpful? Hopefully not over long. Okay, great. Yes, thank you, awesome. All right, one last question here. Anybody, don't be shy. All right, Heather, you're welcome. Christina, Joe, LaFlora, awesome. All right, everybody, well, enjoy the decade ahead. You'll be receiving the recording, the slides, uh, the fundamentals of archetypal astrology as a spiritual practice is the upcoming course, and you can learn this language. You can learn to dance to this. You can learn to read the music of life. And I'm also going to be giving it a live birth chart reading next Tuesday. So keep an eye out for that as well. And I'll actually include the link here. And if I can find it, which I can. But anyways, I'll send that to you as well. And thank you again so much for coming. Thank you if you're watching the recording for staying with us for this full recording. And I look forward to meeting you on the path of this decade and hearing how it's going. Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, Neptune, whoa. All right, gang, it's great to meet you all. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here. <laughs>